here comes the consent. Okay, hello and welcome one more time. Um, this is the practice of digital infrastructure hosted by Code for Science and Society. I am Raya El Zane, uh, a white woman with a face that smiles. And my moving image is beaming into your office or your kitchen or your car from Philadelphia, which is Lenape territory. Thanks for being here. Closed captioning is enabled for this event. You can turn on the live transcript by pressing the CC icon on the bottom of the Zoom window. A reminder to all our speakers and question askers that this works best when we speak slowly. I will just quickly walk us through the general structure of this call and the tools we're using. You'll notice we're in a regular Zoom meeting. Um, you're welcome to do what's comfortable with your camera. The other tool we're using is a Google Doc, which has been linked in the chat. Thank you, Angela. We invite all participants to add their names and affiliation to the roll call on page six of this document. This is a way of saying hi in the absence of bumping into each other in real life. Um, if you have announcements or resources that you'd like to share with the group, feel free to include those as well in the right column. The doc also hosts our agenda for today. On page two, you can see a general plan. On page five and six, our speaker bios. Uh, on page eight, some support for the breakout sessions portion of this event. At any time during this event, um, you can type a question into that Google Doc uh, or into the Zoom chat and we'll collect them and hold them for the Q&A. We're also collecting resources in the shared doc. It'll stay open for 24 hours and then we'll close it and you can find it with this recording um, on the incubator website. Great. A code of conduct guides our engagement here. It's linked in our Google Doc on page two, uh, replete with how to make a report. At CSNS, we strive to create safe, inclusive spaces where people can learn from each other. We are committed to providing a harassment-free environment for everyone, and we try to understand the difference between intent and impact. Our code of conduct is guided by those commitments. At the end of today's event, we'll ask for your feedback in a quick survey but Angela might go ahead and bump a link to that survey right now. Please do fill it out. Um, your feedback helps us secure the funding to continue doing work like this. Thank you, Angela. So I've been asked to convey the regrets of our executive director at Code for Science and Society, Danielle Robinson, who is out sick. I will try to introduce. Um, the Code for Science and Society runs strategic support programs for open source, open data, and open infrastructure programs. The Incubator is a new capacity building program for open source digital public infrastructure projects. As part of that program, we curated this event series, Building Laterally. It's designed to connect conversations about sustainability, governance, and community health in open source to larger political debates. This is the fifth and final event in that series. The series started with a discussion of labor. It moved to a discussion about anti-oppression frameworks in the space, um, focused on the history of codes of conduct. In January, we examined project governance and the range of possibilities and limitations of models like duocracies or mutual aid. And our most recent event explored coloniality and uh, international unevenness uh, in power and access. Recordings of our past events uh, are up on our website. Uh, and that is the link just that Angela just dropped. Today's event, the practice of digital infrastructure turns attention to the work we've been doing with this cohort. And I will, I don't wanna do any more further ado. I wanna just get into it. I've invited our six teams to each speak for eight minutes about each of the projects um, that they lead and what they've been working on in the incubator. Um, you can read more of our speakers' bios in the public doc. Once the lightning talks have concluded, we will move into breakout sessions. There will be three of our teams in each room. Um, and the idea here is to hear a little bit more from them, but also from all of you about how you've been approaching things like sustainability and community in your work. And then we'll come back um, to conclude in a general session. Okay, have I missed anything? Teams, Angela, Paige. All right, well then without any further ado, I'm gonna introduce the first team to speak, uh, Solar Protocol.
That is Alex and Tiga, yeah. Thank you so much, Freya. Yeah. Hey everyone, um, yeah, it's great to be here. Um, so we're Solar Protocol, um, that's Tiga Brain, myself, Alex Nathanson, and then also Benedetta Piantella, who uh, was unable to be here today. So, yeah. so you can start um, looking through the slides. So Solar Protocol is a global network of small scale solar powered web servers. Uh, this animation is sort of giving a, a little overview of some of the um, sort of technical uh, side of the system. Um, so we're a network of, uh, at any given time, about eight to 10 servers around the world, and we direct traffic based on whichever server is in the most sunlight. Uh, yeah, next slide. <laughs> So this is a sort of a snapshot of the network. So a solar server is, in our case, it's running off of a relatively small 50 watt module. So here are um, six of our installations around the world. Um, so it's quite a quite a small system. These systems are designed to be um, just powerful enough to last uh, about a day. They don't have a lot of reserve power, um, and in that way, we're trying to. Oh, yeah, you went mute. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but yeah, in that way, we're trying to set the scale of this project um, to be responding to sort of a, a sort of minimal level of technical need and respond to environmental conditions as opposed to thinking of sort of a maximalist growth at all costs idea of uh, a global network. So, uh, yeah, and here's just another. Um, uh, visualization of our network. So um, this is um, roughly up to date, um, sort of always shifting. But at the moment, we have servers in Canada, the US, the um, in Dominica, Chile, Kenya, and Australia, and the Netherlands. Um, the server in this image in India is uh, not currently online, but this is a general sort of snapshot of the system. There's also a server in Beijing that's also currently offline. Yeah. And so the project relies on the sun as a form of what we're calling natural intelligence. So we're using the distribution of solar energy to automate decisions in the network about where traffic gets sent and therefore where computational work is done to, to um, serve the website. And so the project is exploring, you know, the environmental impact of the, the web, but also um, the politics of automation, right? So it's very much engaging with discourse around AI and the logics we choose to use to automate decisions in infrastructures. Um, so um, in this case, you know, we're using available energy to automate decisions um, where sunshine is determining, yeah, like which server is active. And if we go next slide, you'll see a, a screenshot of the website. Um, so we also have spent a lot of time thinking about web design and what a light sort of uh, energy conscious web would look like and how designing to reduce impact also then has, you know, provides productive constraints for new aesthetics and new approaches to how the web might be designed. Um, so when you go to solarprotocol.net, you know, each uh, version of the site that comes from different servers are customized and you see information about the energy state of the server, how much battery it's got, who the steward is. So a little, so much more context around this, the information about where the server is and who's looking after it than you usually get when you're, when you're interacting with the website. Um, the visualization you see on the front page there, so if we go next slide, uh, gives you a bit of info about the um, operation of the network. So each ring here is a server. And you can see the yellow indicates when they that server has sunshine hours and the colored lines are when each server has been the active server uh, or the one serving the website. Um, if we go next slide, you know, again, there's been, um, we've done a lot of thinking about energy expenditure. So we're making decisions like not using JavaScript because we wanna make sure 
computational work is done server side rather than client side. This obviously flies in the face of sort of web design conventions. Um, and in the last six months, we have been working on a number of things um, on this project. So next slide, we've been working with our stewards to develop content to be hosted on each server. And so this is a couple of websites that we have developed in this time, um, one for a research lab on low carbon methods one of our stewards is running and also we just recently launched um, a website for the Extinction Rebellion Solar Punk Storytelling Showcase. And so as part of our work um, in the context of this fellowship, we've also been working and trying to understand um, what sort of use cases and how our stewards can use the network. And so developing some of these sites has been a part of that process. Another part of that process has also been developing a API for the system. So if we go next slide, Alex, you can. Yeah, I mean, so initially this project really started off as more of a, a sort of design experiment and an art experiment. And as it's grown, it's become uh, more of sort of a platform for um, research in this space, as well as you know, facilitating other people's artworks as well as um, education projects and things like that. And the API is one of the sort of parts of that, um, this sort of next stage of this project, this sort of initiative to make this uh, sort of a, a resource for the broader solar, solar protocol community. So the API allows people to um, engage with a lot of the energy and network data that is going on and integrate that into their own projects integrated into educational units that um, the project is built around. Yeah. So you can go to the next slide. And um, one of the sort of important things that we did over the course of uh, residency or the, the fellowship um, here was work towards building some of these educational resources. And so we presented some of that stuff publicly at uh, a festival in the Netherlands called Fiberfest. That's also the site, the group that hosts the um, the Dutch server. Um, and so that was sort of a, a really important milestone for us to sort of test drive um, and prototype some of these uh, educational opportunities with this project. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then finally, um, we also developed a proposal and a roadmap for the next stages of this project, um, which we have received funding for um, for the next year from um, Mozilla as part of their Creative Media Awards, which is amazing. And just really want to thank <laughs> Raya and um, the whole team for helping us um, get to this next stage. Um, and that, that looks like uh, continuing co-design with our stewards. Um, so through interviews and, and um, um, data collection in that way, um, continuing to develop educational resources, and we are going to use some of the funds to commission some more creative works and texts for the platform. Thank you um, both very much. Yeah, That's a perfect you. eight minutes. Thank you, <laughs> Solar Protocol. Well done. Well done. Uh, the next team that we are going to be hearing from is uh, Open Science Community Saudi Arabia. Uh, hi everyone, um, it's great to be here. I am Batul al uh, computation biologist affiliated with KMARC, which is a research institution in Saudi Arabia and also the University of Liverpool in the UK. So uh, I'm the lead for the Open Science Community Saudi Arabia, which is a bottom-up initiative to make open science knowledge more accessible in Saudi Arabia and also in the Arabic-speaking country and facilitate that communication between scholars and policymakers. Uh, I advocate for open science, particularly in the global south, and how can potentially really can address complex challenges in the region. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, the community. Um, also, I'm going to and the work that we are doing inside the incubator, which is exploring the blockers or challenges behind translating the fair principles in the region. Uh, when I say the region, I mean Arabic speaking countries. Um, next slide, uh, Raya, please. Uh, 
Okay, so the motivation behind the community is there is no community factors, uh, there is no tools, there is no awareness, uh, there is no resources about open science, and there is very, very minimal infrastructure to adopt or learn or understand anything about open science within the region, within the Arabic speaking countries. Uh, and that's the reason we founded the community as a part of a global network uh, called uh, the International Network of Open Science Community, which you might be already familiar with it. Uh, start in the Netherlands. There is also one in Ireland, in Sweden, in Lisbon, in Serbia. Ours is the only one in the Middle East or in the Arabic speaking country. So our vision is to provide really a place in Saudi Arabia where individuals who have no exposure about open science practices can interact with an experienced sphere and can inspire each other to adopt the open science practices in their workflow. And also to provide feedbacks uh, and infrastructure and supported services in the region. Uh, so But well, I think we lost you momentarily. Yeah, that's always happened when I do live. That's why I <laughs> took off the video to save in some bandwidth. Uh, that's okay. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, so. Uh, I'm going to review the vision. So the vision is to provide a place in Saudi Arabia where individuals who have no exposure for open science really can interact with experienced fear, can inspire each other to adopt these open science practices, but also at the same time to provide the feedbacks and the infrastructure that we have and the support services that we have in the region. And our work in the incubator actually align with the second part of this vision. Uh, the slide, please, Raya. So in service of the vision, we are pursuing three areas of work. Uh, this is because as you might already know, open science is really, really huge umbrella. So we are focusing on three areas. Uh, our community members are mostly academic. So we focus on increasing reproducibility in academia both the quantitative and qualitative research. We also encourage contribution to open source through workshops, but the best of practices within open source, such as software citation, like CFF by format, which Stephen gonna speak about in the next talk. Uh, and last but not least, we are also exploring what does it mean to have fair data in the region? Uh, probably most people here in the call more experts about fair principle than me, but for those who are not familiar with it, fair principles is just a set of a principle to enhance the value of digital resources. So fair acronym is for findable, accessible, interpretable, and usable. And it can be applied not just for data, it can also be applied for software, for training, for other uh, contexts. But we are focusing here and enhancing in the data within the context that we have here. So in this incubator, we ask this question, what is the limitation of the current digital infrastructure to adopt fair data practices in Arabic speaking country? How we can in the future derive a new policy that can foster um, a fair data culture? And when I speak about fair, I'm speaking about the minimal fair practices, like, uh, you know, fair is not a checkbox, but I'm speaking about very, very minimal, like having metadata, having license, having some sort of DOI, for example. Uh, next slide. So the reason behind this study, accessing local data has been extremely, extremely challenging. And by local data, I mean community data, such as demographic, education, economic, environment, housing, public data, um, healthy vegetation type, or even academic data generated by acad from academia. And we're not speaking about sensitive data here at all. So this always raised in at least nine out of 10 of our community calls or meetings that the data is not accessible at all. And if you're privileged and well connected and you get lucky to access the data, it's mostly unusable. Um, it's like it's saved in a way that's impossible to be used. So we did a very, very small survey by the community asking academics from different institutions who works in research. Uh, the survey is not perfect, it's just for small size. We ask a few questions such as, do you know the fair principle? Uh, have you had difficulty adding metadata to your data? Do you use a repository to store data regardless if that repository is fair? Uh, I'm very, very mindful of time, so I'm not gonna go through all of them, but just, so for example, one of the questions, do you use any sort of repository? You see that 40% of the people that we surveyed don't know what repository mean and 35% actually know but they don't use it at all. 
Um, there's some also individuals who express difficulty in adding metadata, but and regardless, like right, how representative the sample of the community? Does it mean this is an awareness problem? Can we just promote more understanding of fair and minimal infrastructure, like promote the minimal infrastructure that we have? It's not perfect, it's not exactly satisfying fair principle. Uh, but can we promote it? And by promoting it, uh, can we achieve some sort of availability of the local data? And we can can we re reuse infrastructure that built somewhere else, like general purpose repository, like fixtures in Audio? Um, can we reuse this kind of infrastructure? Um, so can we help? Uh, as a community in promoting fair, or is it not awareness a problem? And there is more depth to it. Uh, so the question again, what is the limitation we have to adopt the fair data practices in Arabic speaking country? Uh, next slide. So we went again and looked at the landscape of open science policy. Uh, we see here everywhere, like even in Asia, Singapore, Japan, China, Malaysia, uh, they have their own policy, they have their own platform, they have some sort of infrastructure. But when you look at the Middle East, or in the very, very middle, uh, there's really nothing that you can see within the map. We know that there's some sort of very, very small initiatives, not as large as the one, it's not as like large as the one you see within uh, another country. There's some, some very, very small initiative. There is minimal, minimal landscape. Uh, so can we go and talk to them? Can we speak to this individual who works in these kind of um, these initiatives, who works in academia and libraries, in any sort of initiative that involves in anything related to open science, like open education resources? Uh, and we try to develop more understanding. Uh, this is what we did in Science Incubator. Next slide. Uh, so in the beginning, we were expecting that the biggest blocker is the awareness. But what we've been discovering is really a new spectrum for blockers that have been never been written about it in the Middle East context, which is very, very equally important. We did interview with the many initiative institutions uh, who actually try to implement the fair practices, but face a very unique challenges. I'm very conscious of time. I know there's one minute just left, so I'm not going to go. Um, through them all, just one, for example, the researchers who have a good faith, for example, and want to publish their unpublished data, or raw data in a repository like Zenodo, uh, might really be charged within their country because Zenodo is like, the data is hosted somewhere outside the, the country and that's something to do with the sovereignty of the data itself. Some country also ended up creating their own license. Uh, there is also no DI registry agency within the MENA. So we've been really discovering new blockers within the region that never been discussed loudly. And we try to put them in the spot line and research them more. Uh, the last slide. So now we have like a better mapping of the landscape of the science in the region. And we really uh, came up with a very unique kind of blockers to adopt in the fair principles within the region. And we documented this within, um, within publication that could be accessible to everyone and all the institutions that try to implement the fair principles. And that's it. Sorry, I went over time. And the last slide, just acknowledgement um, with all people who really helped me throughout this. Thank you, Batul. Wonderful. Great to hear. Okay, the next project we will hear from is citation file format. Stefan, take it away. Thank you, Raya. Um, very excited to be here. I'm Stefan, one of the two co-leads of the citation file format. And you can all, you can, I think you can go to the next slide already. <laughs> this is just the title, so to speak. Citation file format um, aims to make it easier for researchers and research software engineers to get credit for their software work. And this is important because it's if you're a researcher writing software and not papers, then getting credit is a real problem. Um, the project also aims to support provenance and better reproducibility of research results. And the way we do this is by developing a file format and a schema uh, specification, if you like, for software citation metadata, and also a number of tools to work with the citation file format. Um, to make sure that we what we develop is actually useful and usable, we also collaborate a lot with the research software community, uh, metadata community, and um, some working groups. And the general idea behind the format is that if you're a developer, you provide a citation.cff file in this format with your source code. 
and that this file is then used by others to cite the software when they use it because they have all the metadata they need to do that available in the form. Another use case is for other platforms uh, that provide access to or information about the software to be able to reuse this metadata in the file. Next slide, please. Now, providing the citation file format file, um, of which you see an example on the left-hand side, which is a very simple example, um, is already useful if you encounter that in a source code repository. And you can uh, read it, and you can get all the metadata you need to cite the software. But because the file format is implemented in YAML, it's also machine readable, and it can therefore be picked up and forwarded by other platforms. And we see some examples here. For example, GitHub as a source code repository, um, which can be used as format. Um, you can forward that to uh, publication platforms and people can harvest that directly either from the source code repository or from uh, GitHub, for example, into their reference managers and reuse that to write their papers. Next slide, please. Now, the citation file format started as a community format um, in 2017, um, based on a discussion we had at a workshop that it would be useful to have such a standard format for citation files, because before that, people just wrote plain text files and put them into to the repositories, and there is no good way to reuse these, um, for example, if you're, a, if you're a publication platform, for example. Um, we have had many contributions from the community, um, for example, through running community events such as hackathons or single contributions. Um, for a long time, I have been more or less the sole benevolent dictator for the project as a whole. Uh, about three years ago, I was joined in that role, uh, thankfully, by a colleague from the Netherlands East Science Center, Jurian Spax, to lead the project. And by and by, we have kind of gathered more and more subprojects for specific tools, for example, uh, to go from one format to another, um, to validate the citation format, file format files, etc. Um, and these, these subprojects joined the CFF mother project, uh, if you like, uh, but they were still run autonomously, more or less, by, by their original maintainers. And then last year, so we've, we've seen some organic growth over the last few years, up until early summer last year, when we have, there was around 500 CFF files on GitHub, which we thought wasn't bad. But then um, the CFF project as a whole experienced some relatively rapid growth, uh, because GitHub started using CFF to display citation information for the repositories. And then the next day, uh, the publication platform Zenodo announced support as well, uh, followed by a number of reference managers such as Sotero and Jabrev, um, who also added support. So all of a sudden, it seemed that CFF was actually becoming or was being used at least as infrastructure. And while that's you know, really great, um, it also quickly became kind of scary. Uh, this is mostly because we didn't really feel in a comfortable position to manage a piece of infrastructure single-handedly or kind of bi-handedly, if you like. Um, some of the issues that became relevant fairly quickly were around control of the project as a whole versus the control of the sub-projects. So like I said, the sub-project like from specific tools were run autonomously by the maintainers and that's, we, we thought this it would be a good idea to keep it that way, but also we needed some control of the project as a whole. Um, we, had, we discussed oversight, there were some uh, responsibility issues because we didn't feel it was right to retain the whole responsibility for a project that was now being used by other pieces of infrastructure, essentially um, in our own hands. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I think, no, that, that actually was the fourth slide already. Um, so generally we, or I rather, came into this incubator with a very fuzzy idea of creating better governance for the project, um, but I wasn't quite sure what better actually meant in this case. And so a large part of the work in the incubator was developing a clearer picture of what we actually needed, what kind of governance model would suit the project. This sort of actually threw us back into thinking more carefully um, about the, the vision, the mission that we wanted to fulfill as the project as a whole. And then also uh, about how to balance the autonomy of the sub projects with making sure that all parts of this uh, mother project also align to the overall vision. Um, when I speak of project here, what is basically meant by this is the GitHub organization and all the repositories that are in the GitHub organization, which is a very loose kind of um, collection of projects. Um, I have learned a lot 
specifically about potential ways to implement the governance model and what it actually meant to share responsibility, which is a large part of what we want to achieve. Um, and especially through some of the events in this series of events that were part of the incubator, it became quite clear that the questions of power and participation as well um, do really need to play into that governance model as well. And that they're necessary to, to answer if we want to sustain the citation file format project in the long term. So we're not yet at a stage, even after this incubator, where we have implemented anything. Um, but I and we and uh, the work here really made that sure know much better now what the questions are that we need to answer, which uh, sounds low level, but I think it's actually a good achievement for us. Um, part of this is that we now have a clear roadmap for how we do want to develop this governance in iterations. So we're going kind of from the inside to the outside, starting with um, uh, and the leadership internal draft and take this to the to the whole project internal review and do some iterations there. But finally, and that's the most important part, run an open community event for the whole community to review and also to collaborate on the final model that we can then take, implement, also document and live. And that's it, thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Stefan. All right, we're halfway through. We've heard from three of our projects. If you'd like to roll your shoulders with me, do a little wiggle in your chair um, and congratulate the three that we've heard from Solar Protocol, Open Science Community, Saudi Arabia and Citation File Format. Wonderful. OK, the next team we're going to hear from is the team from Ercilia Open Source Initiative. Thank you, Raya. Hello, everyone. I'm Gemma. I'm one of the co-founders of the Resilia Open Source Initiative. I'm here together with uh, Miguel, one of the other co-founders, and we'll try to briefly um, share what Resilia is trying to build in terms of digital infrastructure. And then I think we've given us plenty of time to discuss all we have learned during this incubator, which uh, has been an amazing experience. So thank you to Raya, all the cohort, and, and of course, Code for Science and Society for the opportunity. At Tercilia, we are trying to build a digital infrastructure in a very particular context, which is uh, healthcare research in low-income countries with a specific focus in infectious and neglected diseases. Next slide, Raya. So when we look at the, at the research ecosystem, um, at the healthcare research ecosystem, we see that there is clearly an inequity in the world. It's, there is an imbalance because in low-income low income countries produce only 5% of the world's research output, um, but six out of the ton, top 10 causes of death in those countries are still due to infectious diseases. And only 10% of the drugs that are being developed worldwide at are, are actually targeting those infectious diseases. So there is a large part of population that lives in low-income countries that does not have answers to the diseases they are suffering. Now, this is um, a huge, um, a huge issue that Ercilia is trying to tackle in a very specific direction, which is providing infrastructure to Im start implementing artificial intelligence, machine learning tools, and data science in general in research institutions in those countries so that they upscale their capacity and their skills to do research. Thank you, Vatu, for the link. Next slide. So we are at Ercilia, we are creating what we call the Ercilia Model Hub, which is a free and open source platform of artificial intelligence models to support drug discovery into those infectious diseases. We do value, highly value reusing uh, scientific findings that have already been produced. So we take both models from the literature, develop models that are based on public data, and importantly, develop models in collaboration with scientists in those institutions. Um, for you to get an idea of what is actually that these scientists are facing. So when someone, for example, is trying to cure, uh, find a new drug against malaria, which is still one of the major causes of death in Southern Africa, what they need to do is design new molecules, test that the molecule is effective, test the side effects of this molecule. And then when all this is done, move this molecule into clinical settings and do all those tests again. Artificial intelligence is able to help at virtually any step of this process and really reduce the time and cost for it, which is essential in the low resource settings that we are talking about. 
but the problem is that this technology and these skills are usually very difficult to access and software um, that has been developed for it is very expensive to, to pay for the licenses. So that is why we decided to create this open source platform and bring these expertise closer to experimental scientists that may actually benefit from having access to all this. We have tried this, um, we have piloted our idea in a research institute in South Africa at H3D, where we have developed this platform in-house and is now serving 800 scientists that are actively doing experiments and being supported by our models. So we think this is a great success for the roadmap of the project. Um, next slide, Raya, please. And now I'm gonna hand over to Mikel, but basically our approach um, is not only to develop this platform, but it's much more. So we believe in open science, everything we do is open. We open source our code and make sure it's accessible by any scientist. We value in-country research, which is why the scientific leadership of the projects we engage with uh, resides within our partners. We are just supporters to their research projects. And because we want to make this uh, initiative sustainable, we try to develop as many trainings and workshops as possible so that our collaborators pick up the skills and are able to continue their projects um, when, when we are finished um, with the collaboration. And with that, Mikel, next slide, Raya. Thank you. Yes, hi everyone. I'm, I'm Miguel, originally from Barcelona, and I'm the lead scientist and also co-founder of Ercilia. So I'm just going to present one slide, and this slide only contains three boxes. But I have to say that these three boxes uh, have a lot, of, a lot of work behind, right? These are the things that we've been working on uh, during this incubator. The first box is related to um, articulating our mission. Uh, you've heard already uh, about a few quite impressive missions that uh, our other teams here in the cohort have. Um, in our case, uh, our mission is perhaps a bit more difficult to explain. And, and the first task that we really had uh, during this incubator is trying to explain it first to ourselves, because sometimes it's not so clear what you, what you are trying to achieve, and then, of course, to others. Why do, you, do we have a difficult mission to explain? Well, because what we are doing is actually quite complicated uh, technically. Uh, we are working in this field of AI, which is overall quite cryptic. And we're also working uh, in the field of biomedicine, which of course is very trendy and so on. But when it comes to what we are actually doing and what we are actually achieving, it's quite difficult to convey, right? So um, for us um, to articulate this mission, I, I, I believe it has been very important uh, first to know the landscape. Uh, we both, Gemma and myself, we come from, from a very academic uh, background. So we kind of know the science, but, but of course we didn't know uh, the landscape of uh, tech nonprofits. So um, I have to say that um, identifying this landscape, identifying where we are placed within this landscape, which is trying to implement technology in the global south, uh, has been quite difficult because we are, uh, we are, we are both from Spain, so we, we belong to the, to, to the so-called global north, and we are trying to, to make an action in a place that is remote, right? So, uh, because we really don't want to, to adopt like um, um, colonizing attitudes. Uh, for us, uh, being part of this incubator where there has been so, this series of, of, of talks that have been so inspiring, it has been really useful for us to actually locate ourselves in, in this uh, tech nonprofit landscape. Um, also, I think, and I have to say that the, in this regard, uh, our one-to-one -one conversations with Raya have been uh, very important. Uh, because she, she really is very knowledgeable about, uh, about the, the open source landscape, but also about uh, how one should position within, within this, last, uh, this landscape. Second box um, is related to uh, um, aligning the different documentation that we have uh, around Ercilia. As I said, we come from a very academic background, so um, you, might, you might know it or not, but uh, basically what we do as scientists is we, we do some research, we produce a scientific paper, then we published and then we go, we move to something else, right? This is not how you develop and this is not how you maintain um, a technology, uh, right? So we had to, to convert our tools and our knowledge into something that looks professional. And um, before the incubator, I wasn't really aware that documentation was equally important or maybe more important than the actual code and the actual infrastructure that we were developing. So in this, in this regard, I, I have to say that Andrea has been Again, very useful um, in, in, in trying to structure all the scattered ideas that we have. And also, I have to say that other teams from, from the cohort, especially Stefan, who has an amazing documentation, and if you haven't seen it, just go and check it, uh, have been very inspiring. 
Um, also, for us, uh, Gemma and myself, we, we only use English as a, as a third language, actually. So um, it has been very useful, uh, all the help of Raya to, to articulate all of that. Documentation means, uh, when you are running a tech nonprofit, I believe, means documenting the code, but also documenting nicely the mission, as I was saying, and also um, the government, the governance, and also documenting your history of growth, right? We, we are very small. We are growing, and it's. I think it's very important to to document all, all this procedure of growth that we are experiencing. Finally, um, last box uh, that, that I wanted to talk about is building a community. Uh, this has been also very important, and I believe this was the main reason why we were interested in the incubator. Uh, having said that, uh, we also focused on on the other two boxes. Building a community. Um, that the temptation is. When, when we talk about communities, building a community that, that is as big as possible. In this case, we realized that we didn't want to build a big community. We wanted to build a community that could then act as ambassadors in the countries where we are actually acting, right? So we, we have moved from something that was very, let's expand and let's get more as many users as possible to something that is, let's engage people and let them really collaborate with us. Okay, That's so uh, making this will... mental shift, make you stop there yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, okay. but i invite you to talk more about the community building aspect in the breakout sessions uh sorry to interrupt but i just will keep us moving um very nice uh, let's uh, round of applause for celia the virtual claps are coming fantastic okay we're gonna move on to uh the folks who are building community around the r development guide Uh, thank you, Raya. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Saranjeet Kaur Bhogal, and I am presenting the project on building community around the R Development Guide with my co-lead, Heather Turner. Next slide, please. So this is our report back and discussion session uh, where we will share our journey at the incubator together and reflect on how the incubator helped us uh, in building a community around the Dev Guide. Next slide. So the plan was uh, when we entered into this incubator, we planned to conduct uh, four collaboration campfires. These were designed uh, with discussions with uh, Raya. These campfires are online collaborative events that help to open pathways for members of groups that are currently underrepresented in the R project. And the goal is to mystify the R development process and highlight ways that our programmers can contribute with a focus on low level contribution in terms of time commitment and prerequisite knowledge. Next slide. So in this series of collaboration campfires, we organized uh, five uh, such sessions. The first one starting in January, 2022, which was a community champions meet so in this meet, we designed a plan of how we want to go through uh, the uh, upcoming sessions. So we finally decided to have four more sessions, two on bug tracking process and two on translations in R. So the first, uh, the sessions that started in February uh, were on bug tracking. And then there was another one on how to review bug reports in R. Uh, like yesterday, we just had uh, the third session, which was exploring R's process for translation. And in um, the month of May, we plan to have the final session uh, of this collaboration campfire series. Next slide. So throughout this incubator, we uh, participated in many activities uh, for six months. There were one-on-one -on -one monthly calls with Raya, where we discussed uh, our strategy of how we should run the campfires. There were cohort calls where we used to catch up with fellow participants at the incubator. Uh, we also participated in the Building Laterally series and learned from various experienced people about topics that are relevant to digital infrastructure. Uh, both myself and Heather had weekly calls where used, we used to catch up and prepare for the collaboration campfires. Uh, for the project planning, we used GitHub, collaborative notes, and inspiration from the works of others to plan the campfires. Uh, and finally, we held monthly campfires, which uh, had a diverse set of audience each time. Next slide, please. 
uh, I will invite Heather to explain further. Thanks. Yeah. So part of our aim of these campfires was to connect people together. So as Saranjit has already mentioned, we, we started by uh, connecting with champions from different communities like our ladies or minorities in R, um, so they could give us feedback on our plans and um, be ambas ambassadors to their communities um, to encourage people to come to the campfires. And then we used uh, various ways, uh, Twitter, Slack, um, LinkedIn, uh, podcast, almost yeah, as many ways as we could think of to, to reach out to people and uh, connect them with us. And so that they would attend uh, the campfires and then in the campfires connect with other people that were interested in, um, in collaboration. Next slide, please. And uh, when we were designing the campfires, we tried to um, think of uh, a variety of ways um, that, that people could engage and uh, learn from the campfires. So we used a combination of online learning and collaboration techniques. Um, to do this, to make sure that everyone could make the most of the campfires. Thank you. Um, so there was uh, synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. So uh, the synchronous part was in the campfires themselves. So the campfires were real time live Zoom sessions. Um, we chose not to record these sessions so that people would feel comfortable talking to each other. Um, as comfortable as, as we could make them um, uh, able to participate. Um, we used collaborative notes to sort of structure the sessions and to record our learnings as we went along. And we also provided opportunities for asynchronous learning. So we uh, provided links and take home activities so that they could go over the material at their own pace and do some activities in between sessions. Um, and we also encourage participants to join our, our Develop Slack um, so they could get in touch with us uh, and each other. Next slide. So we wanted individuals to get engaged. We didn't want it to be just us talking to them. Um, so individuals could engage by the activities during the campfires, um, through the take home activities. And uh, we also try to give opportunities um, in the campfire and after the campfire and sort of at the following campfire to report back on, you know, how they were doing and to discuss um, activities and give feedback so um, we could see, uh, you know, what they were picking up or if there were issues or if there were things that we could improve before next time. Next slide. Uh, we also wanted to give opportunity for group work, so we had breakout sessions um, during the collaborative campfires uh, where people could work through the activities together if they wanted to. Uh, and in the session we've just had, we, we tried the idea of creating a collaborative blog post. Um, we didn't create a whole blog post in, in the single session, but the idea was that um, people would, uh, in their different groups, come up with different ways to analyse data uh, on the state of the translations in R, and then we hope to turn that in, into a blog post um, uh, for publication later on. Next slide. Um, yeah. Uh, recently, um, Saranjit and I went to uh, the uh, collaborations workshop organized by the um, uh, Software Sustainability oh. Institute. Yeah. Um, and we thought we'd take this opportunity to participate in the hack day and use that to create a lasting resource based on the materials that we've uh, created and prepared for the campfires. Um, so we put in a pitch and we, we got a team uh, to work on this and our team created uh, a reusable lesson um, using the Carpentries Workbench template. Um, uh, and the lesson was on um, ours bug track bug tracking process, as Saranjit mentioned, that was the, the first, the topic of the first two sessions. And we were really pleased that um, we got the, a couple of other people interested to work with us and our team uh, won third prize. So we were very happy with that. Thank you. Next slide. And back to Saranjit. Uh, so I'll be quick here as there is less than one minute left. Uh, finally, as we uh, come towards the end of this incubator, we are happy to share that our proposal to improve the R development guide has been accepted at the Google season of Docs 20, 2022. 
and we will utilize the learnings at this incubator to improve the R Dev guide further. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the relevant links uh, which you could use uh, to get to know more about our project. Next slide. Uh, thank you so much uh, to Code for Science and Society, Raya, the whole digital infrastructure incubator team uh, for uh, helping us to come up with these campfires and uh, make our project a, su a success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Saranjit and Heather. Our third in this half and sixth and final project we will hear from is Council Data Project. Hello, everybody. Um, so hi, my name is Jackson. Uh, I will be going over Council Data Project, or you might hear me refer to, uh, refer to it as CDP for the rest of this talk. Um, in a short sentence, uh, and I'll go into more of what CDP is, but in a short sentence, CDP can be described as like an open infrastructure for helping people find information and engage with their local municipal council. Um, it's part public interest technology infrastructure and it's part research infrastructure. And uh, again, we'll kind of discuss that later on. Next slide, please. Um, oh no, these didn't, these didn't work. Yeah, just delete them all, it's fine. <laughs> um, that's too bad. Um, as these are deleted, great. Uh, so um, uh, in short, CDP kind of allows a lot of things in relation to finding information about what's happening in your local municipal council. So the first thing that we kind of thought about and did was we made plain text search of past events and meeting items like just generally possible, right? So if you if you were saying like, oh, what's happening in my neighborhood about my local park or my local bike lane, or you know what's happening in terms of housing availability and affordability, um, you might be able to just search, you know, missing middle housing or something like that. You can filter and sort all those events and results um, the big one for us is that we allow or we create timestamps transcripts for every meeting that we process so that you can jump straight to the point in the meeting that you're interested in. Um, and with that, like um, all of the event processing, we try to do as much data linkage as possible. So for any minutes items that are present in the meeting, right, so like a, a report, a presentation, a bill is being discussed, we also store and display all those. And finally, we have all the council voting records. Um, I don't know if you can bring back those those images, Raya, <laughs> but uh, we can do one at a time. Yeah, so so this is like the person page. So this is like where you would find, this is a specific council member that you can find their entire voting record for, C for City of Seattle. Now I'll bring back the next one. <laughs> um, it's, it's behind it, that's too bad. Uh, <laughs> this is um, uh, some, some voting record information for, for a specific event. I won't make you go through all these, Raya, it's okay. Um, let's just go to the next slide if possible. <laughs> um, one of the cool things about CDP from my perspective is we've tried to focus on like the infrastructure aspect. A lot of civic technology projects, a lot of public interest technology projects um, are very much kind of like the, the development or the, the outcome of a hackathon. And one of the things that we really wanted to make possible was, you know, how can others deploy this thing that we've made for Seattle and how, how can they how can we share all those resources in, 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 in time? Um, and so we now uh, have four instances that are all deployed under the same infrastructure. Um, and all these are decentralized. So the, the core tools of CDP, um, like the event processing, the, the transcription, the um, data linkage, and like the website, um, those are all shared by all these instances, but each of these instances is owned by an entirely different group of people. Um, in this case, three of them are owned by kind of the CDP core team, but one of them is owned by an entirely different organization called Open Montana. Um, next slide, please. Um, so coming into the uh, to the incubator, one of the things that we really wanted to focus on was the idea of like, well, we had a couple issues with governance in general, uh, governance and scaling and um, sustainability of the project. The first one was just, um, this is, CDP has been around for about four or five years at this point, and I have always served as the benevolent dictator for life for the PDFL. Um, and, you know, it, uh, as an open source project, it's very hard, especially as, you know, I'm now a grad student and I may not have time uh, for a month or something to really lead the project. It'd be great to kind of step away and say like, hey, can someone else really lead the project for this quarter or something like that? Um, or just really shared, you know, shared leadership of different features and different infrastructure pieces and, and different projects. Um, the other thing as well is I, I tried to touch a little bit on the idea of instance governance, right? So individual deployments, um, their management and maintenance versus the centralized tooling governance, right? So um, each of those four instances for Seattle, King County, Portland, or Missoula are all generally like maintained by different people. Even though I say CDP core team maintains three of them, 
I myself uh, maintain the Seattle one, but two other people maintain the King County and the Portland one. Um, but then all the tools are also kind of like this general bucket of just like, yes, yeah, CDP generally maintains these. And how do we kind of allow others to contribute to the back to this process, um, even though they're just like instance maintainers or something like that? Right? Um, all these toolings are shared. Um, and lastly, sustainable infrastructure. And I, I, I love that I get, uh, since I'm going last, I get to kind of pull from other uh, project presentations earlier. This is exactly right. Like, the, uh, you know, coming from an academic or research background, it's very hard to say like, oh, well, you know, we just move on from the project. But sustainable infrastructure development is like, it isn't just a hackathon or it isn't just like a project that you kind of work on and then and go for, away from. And um, that's a big that's a big part of like, how can we construct the project that is, it both has research aspects while also being this long-term sustainable thing. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the big things that we really want to touch on was the kind of governance documentation. Um, and one of the things that I, I wanted to generally ask was just, you know, how do we support instance maintainers in their own governance? So one of the key, kind of crucial key tools that CDP has created is this could cutter for deployment. So we say, you know, if you use this template for deployment, you can deploy an entirely new instance in about a weekend of time, you know, 20-ish hours, um, like, a, like a hackathon, right? You can deploy an entire instance in a hackathon. But that's the technical deployment. That isn't the community deployment. That isn't the kind of governance, de governance deployment that would be that you would care about a long-term sustainable project. Um, you know, that's that's things like okay, well, we deployed it in a weekend, but what happens? Who's going to change the information come next election, right? So like all those all the people information, all the elected official information that in some cases is automated, in some cases is manually entered. Um, who's going to update that? And who's going to make sure that the data going in isn't bad? Who's going to make sure that you know, if, if bad data goes in, it gets removed and stuff like that, um, and generally just feature development for that instance. Um, and that second point is, is kind of uh, the tooling as well, is the documentation on who maintains the project, who leads the project um, for us as the core contributors, or is it for others, the instance deployments, or for news organizations, or the big one for us, um, because, we, you know, now that we're deployed in multiple locations, uh, and we have had discussions with the, municipal, the municipalities themselves, is, is that documentation for municipal governance, uh, governments as well. Next slide, please. Um, so over the last six months, we've had a lot of, a, a lot, a lot of progress. Um, the big one, I think, and I'm gonna give credit to one of our uh, contributors on the project, Sarah, um, for coming up with the name Feature Cruise, which I really like, um, but it's, it's this idea of, you know, like, okay, we're an open source project, we understand that, and you can't really dictate what any volunteer is gonna work on, uh, to a large extent, but you can say, hey, we would like to develop this feature and we might need a front end person, a back end person, a PM, a designer, all for this feature or something like that. You know, and you can join that, you can go join that feature development. It's great for distributed work and for shared leadership. And it's really elevated, you know, I, I can now say I'm generally leading the project, but I only have my, you know, my finger in, in one specific feature that I'm developing. But it causes some communication issues, um, right? Because when you have a general meeting, how do you make those meetings engaging for all? Um, there's been a lot of technical project uh, progress. So three of those deployments uh, have been deployed in the last six months, which is really great. A lot of new features in the work, some initial research papers and more. The big one um, specifically to governance that I'm so excited about um, that kind of just started up is a playbook for deployment. And one of the aims is specifically to provide guidance on how to sustainably deploy and maintain the new instance that's created. Next slide, please. Um, that's about it for us. Uh, thanks. Uh, feel free to reach out. There's some Twitter handles for myself and my advisor, Nick, and the project as a whole. You can find us on GitHub and on our website. Fantastic. Thank you, Jackson. Uh, thank you, all of you. Please join me in thanking and congratulating our speakers. We are exactly on time, which is exactly the way I like to be. <laughs> Thank you everyone um, for your preparation and for sharing what you've been thinking about. What we'd like to do next is to give our audience um, some space to engage more directly with the speakers and with the teams that we've been working with um, and to give our teams a little bit of discussion time. So what we've done is we've opened two breakout rooms you get to pick, it's not the, Zoom is not gonna do it for you, right? We have two rooms that are open. The first will center around questions of sustainability. And here we will hear more from Solar Protocol, the team uh, building community around the R development guide and citation file format. Um, what I've been hearing from these teams is they've been exploring the sustainability of their project and the landscape 
of open research, open software, open infrastructure in different ways. Um, they are approaching questions of scaling, growth, continuity, their business models in different ways, but I think there might be some productive intersections there. So if you are thinking about sustainability of your project, maybe you want to head over there. In room two, um, we have questions about community or more specifically, what happens before um, community, um, you go about building that community. Here we'll hear more from um, Ercilia, from Open Science Community Saudi Arabia, and from Council Data Project. These teams um, have encountered sometimes tripping on different aspects of power structures and building power decision-making models, uh, where researchers and contributors are based, and if there's an imbalance, how data is stored, etc. So head over there if you're thinking about project documentation, balancing centralization and decentralization, the geopolitics of your project. Of course, there are overlaps, and I could have uh, um, shaken up the deck in different ways and, and had different matchings here. Um, but this is what we're going to go with today. We have about 15 minutes in breakout rooms for discussion, um, and then we'll come back to the general session. Um, so they are open. Uh, room one, approaching sustainability. Room two, before community. And this is, a, this is the choose your own adventure portion of the event. Um, Paige will be in room one and Angela will be in room two and I will be here in the general session. <laughs>